So I would love it if y'all would take a moment and try to appreciate the humor in the title of today's lesson. Does that sound like anything you've ever heard of before? What? Yeah, there's a parable called the parable of the wise and foolish virgins that Jesus spoke. So I've tried to play on that a little bit. Maybe it's a little too early in the morning for y'all to catch that. We needed an extra cup of coffee this morning. Um, I do not have a handout for you this morning because I don't have a handout for myself this morning. I'm just working off my slides. Um, so I put these slides together before I left for camp. Uh, so hopefully uh, the week and a half or so, uh, this, this will still come back to me. Um, we're going to talk this morning about two particular translations that are very popular today. We're going to talk about the ESV briefly and the NIV. We'll spend a lot of time on the NIV because it is by far uh, the most popular Bible of all time. Uh, so many of you use it and uh, or have used it, but more people in the broader religious world use it uh, than do among our fellowship. Uh, but it is a very popular version of the scripture, so we need to spend some time talking about it. So I want to start off with this chart. And I think this graphic will help you see where different translations fit on this chart of literal translation of the scripture versus readability and how easy is it to read. So on the left side, you have readability. The higher up you go, the easier it is to read. The lower you are, the more difficult it is to read. And then across the bottom, you have the literal scale, and you'll notice this terminology, dynamic equivalence and formal equivalence. You remember those, those phrases. We talked about that in our class on translation philosophy. So there's a struggle for translators between being literal and true to the words of the original, but also being readable. So accuracy and clarity. And so these colored dots will help you see where different popular translations fall on this chart. Now, according to this study, the CSB, the Christian Standard Bible, gives you the best possibility for literal accuracy and for readability and clarity. But if you look at the percentages which I know that's kind of small, but if you look at the percentages or just look at the location of the dots, there's a big cluster there that's really close together. So there's really not too much difference in ESV, NASB, New King James, CSB. They're all right there in the same general area, which means those translations will serve you well. Now, which translations do you see as more outliers from the cluster? All right, you see the New Living. It's way up here on the readability scale. But it's way to the left towards the dynamic equivalence on the scale. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the New Living translation is easy to read, but it's probably not a translation that we should do deep study from, because we're not actually getting the words that were spoken by the biblical authors. So use the New Living. I use the New Living. I use it as a comparative translation. Sometimes you read something in a, a more standard or literal translation, say the, the, the NASB, for instance, and it's a little odd as to what the phrasing means. Well. Before you go pull out a Greek lexicon and start trying to read in another language, why not just grab a different translation and compare it first? So the New Living Translation is one that I use for comparison, but not one that I use for deep study. You've never heard me stand in the pulpit with a New Living Translation. Okay? All right. 
Uh, what other outlier do you see that's away from the, the larger cluster of translations? The KJV, yeah, the King James Version. Um, it is much lower on the readability scale than any other version, but it's about as far out as the cluster of translations, standard translations are for literalness or for accuracy. Uh, the KJV is so low on the readability scale, probably for obvious reasons. The language of the King James is just older forms of English, and it's difficult for us moderns to follow. And so you, you see words that were useful in 1769, which is the latest edition of the King James Version. English has changed a lot since 1769. Uh, 250 years ago, we spoke a very different kind of English, didn't we? Uh, so, and there's no need to change the KJV or update it because that's what the new King James Version is. So the KJV will never change. <laughs> uh, the new King James may continue to be edited and, and republished, uh, but the KJV is not going to change anymore. All right, so if you have... ESV, NASB, New King James, the New Revised. There's some problems with the New Revised, but there's problems with all translations. No translation is perfect, um, except for the Ben Walker Upstate of South Carolina version. Um, and the CSB, all of those that are right there in that cluster, you're going to do well with any of those translations. Okay? All right, so any questions or comments about the chart? Joe? Do you, do you know what, and this may not be a direction you want to go with it, but do you know what the, the case for King James only is for those that make that case? Is there like a different thing? I'll, I'll say it this way, Joe. I, I don't know their argumentation well enough to present it to you in such a way that's not a mockery and I don't want to do that, okay? W one of the arguments that I do know is used is the older editions of the KJV were, they, it said on the title page, you know, the authorized version, okay? And I talked about that in our class on the King James Version, uh, but obviously that doesn't mean it was authorized by Christ. That means it was authorized by King James of Scotland. <laughs> so, okay, all right. Anything else about the chart? Is that helpful? Can I give you an idea of where some of the popular translations stand? Okay. No, you shouldn't do that. Are, do, you, do you read from the King James, Judy? What do you read from? I'm sorry? The New King James? Oh, okay. All right. What, well, what do you feel guilty about then? Well, that no, I, and I'm not. I'm not saying that you you can't use the NIV or whatever. I, I, that's not what I mean. I'm just saying you see where you see this this cluster here kind of gives you an idea of the the best possible direction because these are both farther out on the literal scale and higher up on the readability scale. It's really difficult to get a translation that's in this area. It's really challenging. Yeah, yeah, I understand. All right, so let's talk about the ESV. Um, I'm not going to really analyze a whole lot of passages from the ESV. We will compare some with the NIV when we get to it. Uh, the ESV was the work of more than 100 people. Uh, you remember when we talked about how to choose a translation, one of the things I said was, was it published by an individual scholar or by a group of scholars, right? And with individuals who are translating, you don't know what you're going to get. There's no checks and balances for them. But with a group translation, you've got larger numbers of scholars who can work with each other and make ed edits and changes and revisions to each other's work. So the ESV appeared in 2001. It was revised in 2007. And they quoted the translators of the King James Version in the preface which they wrote in 1611, where they said that the Bible is God's sacred word, and it is that inestimable treasure that excelleth all the riches of the earth. That was the philosophy that the English Standard scholars brought to their work. We agree with what the original King James authors said in their view of Scripture. 
So from the preface of the ESV, it says the ESV is, quote, an essentially literal translation that seeks as far as possible to capture the precise wording of the original text and the personal style of each Bible writer. As such, its emphasis is on word for word correspondence. We have sought to be as literal as possible while maintaining clarity of expression and literary excellence. Now, when you look at those phrases highlighted in yellow, are we talking about a dynamically equivalent translation or a formally equivalent translation? Formal, yeah, all right. Your translation, whether it's ESV, New King James, New American Standard, most likely in its preface will have language like this. And it will tell you the philosophy of the scholars who worked on the translation. So the English Standard Version scholars are telling you, we are trying as best we can to give an English correspondence to the same Greek or Hebrew term. So the ESV, in my judgment, uh, overall is a very good translation. It would be comparable to the New American Standard or the New King James uh, and other versions that were on that chart that I showed you just a moment ago. I really like the ESV. Uh, again, every translation has some problems. There are a few passages here and there that I wish the ESV had translated differently. Uh, but I can understand at least why scholars made the decisions that they did. One of the things I don't like about the ESV, however, is that it does not use italics or brackets. I can only guess as to why that is. And the guess that I can give is when the fonts of the text change and you italicize or you put some in bold, it just takes away the uniformity of appearance. It makes the text look different. And so maybe they just wanted it to look more uniform, so they elected not to use italicized words. But translations need to use italicized words because the words in italics are those words that are inserted by translators to help us get the sense of the word's usage in the verse. So there are times when the translators have to supply words to help modern English readers understand what the original Greek or Hebrew meant. And it's useful to us that they do that, but we want them to tell us when they do that. There are some words that are not in the original Greek or Hebrew. And the translators add them in to help us. But if they don't tell us, hey, we added in these two or three words here, then we might walk away thinking that those words were in the original when they're not. So italics, you know, when I was a kid, or when all of us were kids probably, if we saw an italicized word in a book, what did that mean? You emphasize the word, right? It's italicized because of emphasis. That's not what it means in translations of Scripture. Those are supplemental words added by the translators to help give the sense of the original. Brackets in the text often will show editor's notes, usually regarding manuscript differences. Anybody have the ESV? All right, open up to Acts chapter 8, everybody, but especially those with the ESV. I want you to see something. Acts chapter 8. This is the story of the conversion of the Ethiopian eunuch. Something interesting that happens here in Acts chapter 8, when Philip and the eunuch are going along the road, and the eunuch says in verse 36, Look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Now look at verse 37. Um, Corey, would you read verse 37 in the ESV? Corey, come on, read verse 37. Come on, Corey, read verse 37. Here's the thing. In the ESV, verse 37 is not there. Corey, does it go from 36 to 38? Yes, sir. Yeah, there is no verse 37 in the ESV. The CSB doesn't have it either. Why? What's going on here? Now, for those of you who don't have the ESV, you have a verse 37, right? Do you have brackets around verse 37? Okay, not all translations do. Celeste, you have brackets around verse 37. My version does too. Does yours have a footnote or anything for verse 37? Yes, 
And what those brackets, what does it say, Jerry? It is found in Western texts, including the Latin translation. All right. Verse 37 is only found in the Western texts, the Western manuscripts. Not all manuscripts contain verse 37. So the ESV and the manuscripts that it used for its translation doesn't contain verse 37. But the scholars of the ESV recognize all these other translations out here have it. So we have to do something here. We can either make a note of it, we could put it in brackets, and we could, uh, well, oh, but the ESV doesn't use brackets. Okay? But other translations, bracket verse 37 with a footnote that says, here's why this is in brackets. Okay? There are notes like that in different places in your New Testament. And whenever you see, I mean, how awkward could this be, right? You've you got a Bible study with somebody, and he's got an ESV, and you've got a New American Standard, and you're reading, and you say, go ahead and read verse 37. And he's, uh, okay? He has no idea what you're talking about. Man, there's a typo in my Bible. There's no 37. No, there needs to be an explanation as to why it isn't there. Overall, I really like the ESV. few changes I would make, but they didn't consult me when they published all right, let's talk about the NIV. Yes, sir. Go ahead. Since it literally, I mean, literally skips from verse 37, was that part of the, like, the way, was the verse layout, like, original to the ESV? Like, when they, did they ever have the verses, the verse number, when they created the ESV or translated the ESV? Or was that, like, or did that, when did, when did the dating of the putting chapters and verses match up with the ESV version is what I'm asking? Because what I'm saying you know, the standardization of the numbering of verses. Mm -hmm. When did they create chapters and verses? Was that King James Version? No. Okay. So, chapter divisions yep. first appeared in the 1200s. Okay. Gotcha. Verse divisions came about 100 years later, okay. gotcha. in the 1320s, okay. 1330s, I think. Um, Tim, I've researched your question. Tim asked me a few weeks back, have the chapter divisions and verse divisions changed over time. I can't find anything about that in all the works that I've consulted. I, I, all I have found is when they were introduced. I've not found anything about changes that have come. I, just common sense would make me think, yeah, surely. Because, I mean, there's so many uh, chapters and verses. Surely there's been some changes that have been made over time but I haven't found anything in a scholarly work that addresses that. Um, so Jonathan, I, I think to answer your question, when, when the, the scholars of the ESV are working on their text, they have not only the original manuscripts, the copies of manuscripts that have come along in, in, in subsequent centuries, but they also have modern works. And the modern translations all follow the same numerical system. The exception being the Jewish Bible, the Hebrew Bible. Sometimes a verse that's, um, you know, chapter 12 and verse 1 in the Hebrew Bible might actually be chapter 11 and verse 58. You know, they'll, they'll change it one verse or something like that. Um, but modern English translation, what are usually considered Protestant translations, they all follow the same format. So I would think that the ESV just said, in our assessment, based on the manuscripts we're using, we don't think verse 37 was in the original that was written by Luke, so we're just going to leave it out and go from 36 to 38. Well, I mean, because I find that interesting, because that's why you know, at least even though you don't have brackets on italics, if you suddenly realize, hey, we just skipped a verse, it's and something's up between your version and maybe another translation. Yeah, okay. Yeah, and, and sometimes, believe it or not, Bibles do have typos in them. Um, Kyle Markham is not here this morning. He just bought a brand new Bible that I recommended. I, oh, Kyle, this Bible, it's so nice. You've got to buy it from this company, man. They make the best Bibles. And, and he did it. And then he stood up and he said, hey, check this out. This Bible has a notation that says Philippians has five chapters. It doesn't have five chapters. But in the, in the, uh, the chapter headings at the top margins, one of his says Philippians 5. It's clearly a typo. How did that happen? Somebody got fired, I guess. All right. 
the NIV. It debuted in 1973, and it was sponsored by the International Bible Society, hence the name, International Version. There was a major update in 2011, which we'll comment on in just a moment. 115 scholars that worked on this signed a statement of faith that they believed that the Bible is the inspired Word of God. And participants of the scholars were from a varying and diverse background of denominational and ethnic groups, also part of the reason it's called the New International Version. There were scholars from Europe and Africa and North America and South America, all over the world, scholars worked on this translation. Now, the New International Version is more of a functional or a dynamic equivalence, but it's really more middle of the road. It's not as far functional and dynamic as the New Living Translation, uh, but it is more of a middle of the road approach. It has an emphasis on simplicity and readability. But as they say, there's also a desire to translate the original text faithfully and accurately. Now, the problem here is that the first two things often collide with the third. You want to give a readable translation. You want it to be simple. You want people to understand the thought of the passage, but you also want to convey the original text faithfully. Something has to give. You can do either or, but not both. But there are some problems with the NIV, the original 1973, and then also a 1984 version. The 19, if you have an NIV that you purchased uh, before 19, or excuse me, before 2011, it's the 1984 version. So the comments that I'm about to give you are, for the most part, true for the 1984. Some of these problems I'm going to point out with the NIV were changed in the 2011. Not all of them, but some. One of the problems with the 84 NIV is problems with sentence structure. The NIV often takes long sentences in the Greek and they divide them into short ones to make them more readable. The problem with this is it often destroys the logical flow of the sentence. So the Apostle Paul had a proclivity to be a little bit wordy at times. In Ephesians chapter 1, you have a sentence that spans eight verses. And it's just one big long sentence. But in the NIV, they will take sentences like that and chop them up into smaller thoughts. And they do that to be more readable, more concise. But the problem is, Paul had a reason for that long run-on sentence. He had a logical progression of thought that was flowing through his mind and through his pen. So the NIV, while they shorten sentences, it forces translators to remove important connector words like conjunctions, for, but, because, and. Here's an example. Romans chapter 1, verses 17 and 18. NIV on the left. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed, a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. The wrath of God is being revealed from heaven against all the, God, all the godlessness and wickedness of men. But compare that with the ESV. Verse 17, the righteous shall live by faith for, because, you see that conjunction? There's a flow of thought here. And the NIV just begins a new paragraph. Whereas the ESV, the New American Standard, the New King James, and others keep that conjunction, which is in the Greek, by the way. They keep it because it shows the logical flow of Paul's thought. Another problem with the NIV Sentence ambiguity. There are some biblical words and sentences that are ambiguous. That's true. Let's just think about this. If, well, now, wait a minute. That button's not supposed to do that. All right. Now it worked. No, I did that. That's what I want. I don't want you to read ahead of me. I wanted a black screen. 
um, the phrase, the love of God, is all over the New Testament. The love of God. How might we understand that? No, 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 just just think. How might we understand the phrase, the love of God? God's love for us. How else could we understand it? Our love for God. Okay? So God's love for Christians, God's love for the world, our love for God. There's multiple ways we could understand that biblical phrase. It's ambiguous. The context of the phrase helps us understand what's being said. But the expression itself, just on its own, is ambiguous. So how do you deal with that if you're a translator? Well, the translators of the NIV use their judgment to determine the meaning of the passage because they're trying to convey the thought of the passage. Remember? Functional, dynamic equivalence. Now there's some problems with this. They might be wrong in the way they translate it. They might be wrong in their understanding of it. It prevents the reader from making the judgment for himself. What does that expression, the love of God, mean? Does it mean my love for God, God's love for me, God's love for the whole world? What does it mean? I, I need to figure that out. I need to decide that. And it prevents me from doing that when the translator makes the decision for me. I would, I would read it and never even think about it what else it might mean. And I think in the Scripture there's some ambiguity that's a both-and proposition. It's not an either-or. Sometimes in the Scripture you see something that's ambiguous and you say, well, does that mean this or does that mean that? And the answer is yes. Both are true. But the NIV takes that away when they choose for you what they think it means. Here's an example. Same passage. Romans 1, 17. For in the gospel, a righteousness from God is revealed. What does the original say? It says, the righteousness of God, as is reflected in the ESV. The righteousness of God. Are we talking about God's personal righteousness? That He is a righteous being? Or are we talking about the righteousness that He bestows upon men who are followers of His Son? Which is it? The Greek is, ambig is ambiguous. How do you know which one it is? The NIV translators made the decision for you. A righteousness from God. How did they understand that expression? Righteousness that God gives to His followers. Is that true? Yes, that is true. The gospel does make men righteous. But if you just read from the NIV, you would have never even considered the other possible interpretation. They've made the decision for you. A righteousness from God is revealed. This is the NIV. A righteousness that is by faith from first to last. That is not what the Greek says. The Greek says, as reflected in the ESV, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith for faith, or from faith to faith. What does that mean? From faith to faith, or for What does that mean? It's ambiguous. Well, there's at least a couple of different ways we could think about that expression. But the NIV translators made their judgment and put it into the text. And if all you're doing is reading from the NIV, you may not consider other possible explanations of ambiguous expressions. Does that make sense? All right. Word consistency. This is one of my biggest gripes with the NIV. The, the NIV follows modern English practice of avoiding use of the same word in the same sentence or paragraph. We don't want to use the same words over and over and over again. We want to make our reading a little bit different. We want to have some variation in it because it makes the reading a little less stale. Now, if the same Greek word is used in a different sense, then it ought to be translated differently in the English. But if the sense is the same, then translators ought to use the same English words. Because if you don't, it obscures the connection between words and ideas. So here's some examples. The word flesh in the book of Galatians 
In the NIV, 1984, Galatians 3 and verse 3, are you so foolish? After beginning with the Spirit, are you now trying to attain your goal by human effort? In chapter 4 and verse 23, same Greek word is translated the ordinary way. Same thing in verse 29. Chapter 5 and verse 13, the same Greek word is translated sinful nature. Now look at the ESV. Flesh, 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 flesh. Why? Because that's what the Greek word means. Flesh. But the NIV translators use a number of different expressions or words to translate the exact same Greek word. The Greek word is sarx, the word flesh. The Greek word sarx occurs 151 times in the New Testament. In the King James Version, it's translated flesh 147 times. In the NIV, only 37 times do they translate it flesh. The NIV uses 22 different words or phrases for other occurrences of the exact same Greek term. They use the expression sinful nature 27 times to promote their Calvinist theology. You see the problem? Paul's writings especially use this word. And he talks about the desires of our flesh, the lusts of our flesh. And when you see the same word used again and again and again in Paul's writings, you notice common themes and common elements of what he is saying from book to book. But when the NIV uses 22 different words or phrases for that same Greek word, it conveys different meanings entirely, or, and possibly, it misleads you and makes you miss these common ideas in Paul's writings. Now, to their credit, in the update of 2011, they made this a lot better. From the moment it was published, scholars blasted the NIV because of its treatment of the word flesh. They heard that for 35 years, and so they decided to change it in their update. A major revision in 2011, and they made substantial changes to it. However, the word flesh still is only used 74 times, which is just a little over half of the times that the Greek word sargs is used. They only use the words sinful nature twice, which is so much better than the 22 times, I think I said, uh, 27 times, thank you, uh, from the 1984. The update is much better. It's still got some problems, but it's better. Is the NIV, or as I jokingly call it, the non-inspired version, can you use it? Absolutely you can use it. Especially use it for comparison. Use it for uh, you know, comparing one, one standard translation to the NIV. It's useful for that. I wouldn't do my primary study from it. But sure, it's useful. Every Bible is useful. Most every Bible is useful in, in some way. Uh, so the, I'm, not, I'm not saying, you know, go burn your NIVs. Don't do that. I have lots of NIVs on my shelves, okay? I just don't do my deep study or preaching from them. All right. You may have a question about, you may not have a question, but uh, you might have a, a thought about, well, I want to buy a Bible for my grandchild. Which one should I get? Start with something more readable. Something like the NLT, the New Living Translation, something that can help a child grasp some of these ideas. As they get older, move them towards a standard translation. We've done our kids, uh, we, we've started them off on the New King James because I think that of the more standard translations, the New King James is a little bit easier to, to, to grapple with. Uh, and they've done just fine with that. But depending on the age of the child, depending on their ability to read and comprehend, just consider some of the different translations. The New Living would be a good one for a young child especially. Um, I'll, I'll open it up here. This is the last Sunday of the quarter. You know, you got a minute or two to ask me anything you want. Jerry? Somebody commented and mentioned one 
place where he met the young lady uses the King James Version, and the NIV was the, I guess, it was the devil's work, huh? Yeah, right. Only the King James Version can be read in the assemblies. Yeah, I, I can't go along with that. Um, just there's there's too many there's too many problems with that. Kelly. I can't really speak to that. I know in our group, a lot of the, uh, I don't want to say all, but most of the, the kids and parents that I see with their Bibles have the NIV. Uh, and I think that's just because of its Calvinistic and denominational persuasion. Um, it, it doesn't surprise me to, to hear about your experience, but I, I can't say what causes it. Tim? Yes, uh, when, when you I, can. When I came out of denominationalism at age 25, I had had, had a NIV study Bible for a couple of years. I learned the gospel from studying that Bible. But I, did, I don't, I still have that Bible. I don't use it much. Yeah. But uh, I wore it slam out uh, during that time. Sure. But, uh, but anyway, you can learn the gospel from all of them. And we also need to remember that uh, for most of human history since... Uh, the day of Pentecost, people didn't have a personal Bible. That's so right. Most of what they learned was verbal, you know, was yeah. the mouth stuff. So. Yep, that's right. And, and the, the purpose in this is not to ban books. Um, you know, you start saying one translation is better than another and people think you're talking about their babies and saying that one's cuter than another one. And, you know, that's certainly not my effort here, but I do want your eyes to be open to some things and I want you to know about these different translations. Um, do, do, you feel, do you feel like you've learned some things this quarter about the history of the Bible and, and how, how we got it and all that? You, you feel, feel like it's been beneficial? I hope so. Uh, I think our class has dwindled a good bit from the time we started, um, and I don't know what accounts for that, probably just the teacher, I'm sure, but um, the, uh, the study was good for me, uh, the content was good for me to go through, I hope it was beneficial to you as well. Um, some of you have asked me before, well, what's my favorite translation? Uh, mine is currently the New American Standard, that's the one I've been using for I don't know, 20 years now, um, but that's not to say that it's the best one. There are things about the New American Standard I don't like, uh, but that's true of all of them. No, none of them are perfect, and that's been true uh, of, of all translations throughout history. They all have certain flaws and things that could be different, but even in those things that are different or flawed, in most cases, the scholars had legitimate reasons for deciding what they did, and I can understand why they did that. Uh, so. Use your Bible, love your Bible, familiarize yourself with it so much that you know where things are on the page and you can find it in a moment's notice. Um, and then when the Bible is falling apart, get it rebound. Uh, they say that Bibles that are falling apart belong to people who aren't, and there's a lot of truth in that. So, um, all right, thank you everybody. I appreciate you so much. <laughs>